Welcome to Word Pictures, a program of discussion and discovery. We examine the stories, events, and persons as described in the Word Pictures, presented in the 66 books of Scripture we know as the Word of God. But what kind of God is pictured here? By reading these stories, some become fearful, others adore. Yet others are just confused. Come, let us see for ourselves in an unrehearsed, no question barred discussion with people just like you as we search for the God of these stories. What picture of God will emerge for you? Let's join the discussion right now. Hello, welcome to Word Pictures. Today we're talking about the Gospels in the early years of Jesus and specifically right now let's begin to cover around the time when he was 12 years old at the temple. Ken? Okay, so at age 12 Jesus was taken by his parents. Apparently uh, before that they didn't take him up to the temple but at age 12 he was taken to the temple for the first time as the, uh, as a bar mitzvah. This was the time for him to be a son of the law. That's what bar mitzvah means. And he went there and he started looking around and he saw what was going on there and his mind went into high gear. He had done his studying. He knew what the Old Testament. He knew the scrolls. And he started thinking. He looked and saw what was happening at the temple and he started comparing that with what he had read in the, in the Bible and the Old Testament. Yeah, now is this, are we to infer that this is his first time to be in Jerusalem at the temple. Well, it's the first time he was cognizant of being in the temple. He had been there to be dedicated days That's for 40 days. Okay, but he hadn't been back there in the last Not as far as we know. Years. There's pretty good evidence that he was not. And what was going on here that he's, that stirred all this awakening, so to speak? Well, let's think about that. What, what was going on in the temple? Money this was changing. Passover time, right? So, well, there was sacrifices going on, I would assume. Mm -hmm. Yeah. People everywhere. Buying and selling. Lots and lots of people. There were the temple courtyards have been turned into a marketplace. Yes. Okay. A lot of he money did. being made where it shouldn't have been. A lot of money being made where it shouldn't have been. The higher ups were walking around in their finery mm -hmm. and um, causing yes. attention to themselves. And as adulterated as it may have kind of become nevertheless those old sacrificial systems that were pointing to the Messiah that was to come and redeem the world and so on and so forth that was going on there that was going on there too and Jesus figured it all out apparently by and large by himself putting together Stuff from what, the Old Testament. That's right. What he had read in the Old Testament, uh, all those as well. The whole, the, whole, the, the whole Old Testament, Genesis to yeah. the first five books anyway. What you assume, what he, we mentioned last uh, in our last session he had some scrolls or access to some scrolls would be, there have been some of the Isaiah scrolls and the Jeremiah scrolls. or, maybe. And we had a suggestion at least that maybe he was instructed by angels. Do you think that he knew that he was the lamb of the world? Well, that's a good question. When we get a little further along in the story, quite a few years later, what is that, 15 years later at age, well, not, it would be, it would be 28, you know, 18 years later, uh, when he begins, ready to begin his ministry, he shows up at the place, he's baptized, he goes off for the temptations, he comes back, and John says, Behold the Lamb of God. You know, uh, we keep talking in this class about being the friend of God. Mm -hmm. Don't you think God, uh, Jesus would be the best friend of God? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't know if you would just look at him as a study or just putting it all together, you know, reading words, that his communion with God actually helped him interpret all this stuff. Mm -hmm. I have to think so. I mean, everybody around him was misinterpreting, but somehow or other he got it right. But well, you know, it's nice to go to the source. He had the scrolls there. And even after the great disappointment, the people did not run to the school of theology to ask what happened. What they did is they opened the Bible and started studying it word by word. 
And so sometimes when you get rid of the clutter and you get rid of um, the learned um, pattern, people say this is the way it is even though maybe it doesn't read that way. You just get out and you actually read God's Word. Um, amazing things happen. Yes. Why, why wouldn't he have known? Mary probably mm -hmm. told him something as he was growing up. Yep. And if you've had anything to do with smart kids, and he must have been 12-year-olds have a more uncluttered mind than most of us do. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So is it, is it reasonable to assume that Mary sat him down before this time at some point and said, you, you need to know some things about your birth? Yes. This yeah. angel came one night and... Well, I mean, and, and there were other people telling him other not so nice things about exactly. his birth. So she had to she straighten had that out, I'm sure. Yeah. Well, if you're thinking about Mary, you've got to think about her, too. I mean, she knew that where he came from. Mm -hmm. Just try to think about having a son grow up. Nothing seems to be happening. Mm -hmm. All the way to 30, nothing has happened yet until, you know, the marriage feast. Mm -hmm. but well, you know, well we, we, let's, we, let's go back to the age temple 12. here at age 12. I sort of have the picture that uh, uh, there, there were classes going on, that mm -hmm. there were a lot of 12-year-olds. This was, this was a big event, and yeah. this was uh, an opportunity for the, for the Pharisees and the Sadducees to to hold forth and look forward, uh, look look over the new the incoming class, right? Yeah, yes. you know, and uh, so uh, I, I can see a young man slipping in with the group mm -hmm. there, and uh, say, oh, by the way, wait, 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 what do you think of this passage? Mm -hmm. You know, how, how how does this how does this fit in? You know, mm -hmm. and uh, he or had them or scratch. you know or saying you know that doesn't seem to fit in with this passage. How do how do we reconcile? <laughs> yeah, wasn't, wasn't there a stricture against poor people, or did they relax the rules? When you sort of read about how the temple functioned, the different yeah. courtyards, how did he get in there? Well, this was apparently, there was, uh, there, there was apparently a school area that was somewhere, in, you know, attached to the temple, but not right in the temple. Okay. So that's apparently who's attracted to that. Again, may I read a few words from Ellen White? Among the Jews, the twelfth year was the dividing line between childhood and youth. On completing this year, a Hebrew boy was called a son of the law, that's a bar mitzvah, and also a son of God. He was given special opportunities for religious instruction and was expected to participate in the sacred feasts and observances. It was in accordance with this custom that Jesus and his boy had made the Passover visit to Jerusalem. Like all devout Israelites, Joseph and Mary went up every year to attend the Passover, and when Jesus had reached the required age, they took him with them. That's Desire of Ages, page 75, first paragraph. For the first time, the child Jesus looked upon the temple. He saw the white-robed priest performing a solemn ministry. He beheld the bleeding victim upon the altar of sacrifice. With the worshipers, he bowed in prayer while the cloud of incense ascended before God. He witnessed the impressive rites of this Paschal service. Day by day he saw their meaning more clearly. Every act seemed to be bound up with his own life. New impulses were awakening within him. Silent and absorbed, he seemed to be studying out a great problem. The mystery of his mission was opening to the Savior. Wrapped in contemplation of these scenes, he did not remain beside his parents. He sought to be alone. When the Paschal services were ended, he still lingered in the temple courts, and when the worshipers departed from Jerusalem, he was left behind. In the visit to Jerusalem, the parents of Jesus, wishing to bring him in connection with the great teachers of Israel, while, wished to. While he was obedient in every particular to the word of God, he did not conform to the rabbinical rites and usages. Joseph and Mary hoped that he might be led to reverence the learned rabbis and give more diligent heed to their requirements. But Jesus in the temple had been taught by God. That which he had received, he began at once to impart. So here we see a young boy who has a connection that they don't know anything about. And they're the ones who think they have all the knowledge and they're ready to teach him. It, it occurred to me uh, as you were reading there that it's only at Jerusalem where sacrifices were, were, were made. 
So this would have been the first time in his memory yes. that he had seen the sacrifice. Lambs being offered. He'd read about it many, 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 many times in those yep. 12 years. Yep. Hundreds of times. Well, at that day, reading on from page 78 in Desire of Ages. I have a question. Yeah. Did, um, when they came, did Mary and Joseph bring a lamb to be offered also, do you think? There's no record of that. What we know is this, that uh, if, you, if you can believe the, the extra biblical evidence, about 20, 10 years or so after Jesus was dead, now this is not talking about this particular occasion, but sometime later, t about 10 years after Jesus was dead, somebody decided that they needed to, to take a census and do some record keeping, talk about what happened at Passover time. And they went and they estimated that there were two million people in Jerusalem at, at, at Passover time. And again, I don't know how they did all their counting or how accurate they were, but that was their estimate. And they, the other, they went on to say that at the temple, there were priests all over the place accepting sacrifices. And because there were so many people who wanted to make offerings, you had to have 10 people come with a single lamb. They, everybody couldn't come with their own lamb. There just wasn't enough, uh, sac enough altars, enough priests, enough whatever to sacrifice that many lambs. So you, you'd have to get together 10 people together and take one lamb and then you would all come together and I, I guess all put your hands on the same lamb and, and all together. So that's one way they sort of saved on lambs and, and, and uh, you know. It's been described that, that it, even at that time, it was like a river of blood right. going down there into the Kidron yeah. Valley. Yeah. It was just horrible. Yeah. And they would, could, maybe would purchase a lamb, maybe, maybe a, a group of families or got and together. There's, there's evidence about that too. If you were outside the temple wall, uh, lambs could be bought for, you know, what would be equivalent of a few dollars. Inside the temple, uh, where they were, lambs were quote, approved by the priests, uh, they were maybe 15 or 20 times as expensive. Yeah. yeah. And the shepherds we talked about that uh, saw the star mm -hmm. were in that area where they may have been the shepherds who raised sheep for the temple. It's quite possible. Mm. Yeah. Well, at that day, reading on from Desire of Ages, the, an apartment connected with the temple was devoted to a sacred school after the manner of the schools of the prophets. You remember that was the, those were the schools started first by Samuel and then really built up by Elijah and Elisha. Here leading rabbis with their pupils assembled and here, hither the child Jesus came. Now he's separated from his parents. Seating himself at the feet of these grave learned men, he listened to their instruction. As one seeking for wisdom, and notice what he's doing. What's he doing? Seeking he's saying, their please, wisdom. please teach me, right? He questioned these teachers in regard to the prophecies and to events that then taking place that pointed to the advent of the Messiah. See, they must have been talking about that kind of stuff. And Jesus said, well, look at the prophecy of Daniel, da, da, da. And when is that going to happen? Time is coming, right? Jesus presented himself as one thirsting for a knowledge of God. His questions were suggestive of deep truths which had long been obscured, yet which were vital to the salvation of souls. While showing how narrow and superficial was the wisdom of the wise men, every question put before them a divine lesson and placed truth in a new aspect. The rabbis spoke to the wonderful elevation which the Messiah's coming would bring to the Jewish nation. But Jesus presented the prophecy of Isaiah, that would be Isaiah 53, and asked them the meaning of those scriptures that point to the suffering and death of the Lamb of God. Can you imagine? I mean, imagine that situation. Here you have these very learned PhDs sitting up there in, in a row, if you will, and here's a child, you know, just all the kids are squirming around and moving around. And, well, probably not too much because that was probably a very solemn occasion. And Jesus says, well, but what about Isaiah 53? <laughs> the irony of it was it confronted them later on, didn't it? Yeah. Well, the doctors turned upon him with questions. And they were amazed at his answers. 
With the humility of a child, he repeated the words of Scripture, giving them a depth of meaning that the wise men had not conceived of. If followed, the lines of truth he pointed out would have worked a reformation in the religion of the day. A deep interest in spiritual things would have been awakened, and when Jesus began his ministry, many would have been prepared to receive him. He's already spreading the gospel at age 12. The rabbis knew that Jesus had not been instructed in their schools, yet his understanding of the prophecies far exceeded theirs. And this thoughtful Galilean boy, they discerned great promise. They desired to gain him as a student, that he might become a teacher in Israel. Of course, assuming they would learn to teach the way they taught. They wanted to have a charge of his education, feeling that a mind so original must be brought under their molding. They could not but see that their expectation in regard to the Messiah was not sustained by prophecy. What do you do when a 12-year-old boy shows up and confounds all the scholars and proves that they're wrong? You know, as a um, teacher in a classroom, you're confronted with students that are smarter, and you either shut them down or you learn from them. You know, it can go depending on the type of person that you are. So those people shut him down. Mm -hmm. Well, it goes on to say, but they would not renounce the theories that, flattered, that had flattered their ambition. You know, you know Ken, in a sense, um, I'm not, enough, not an authority on, on that time or, or those people, but, and correct me if, if this is not correct, but it's my understanding their approach to understanding of the scriptures, and we're talking about the Pharisees, were, was always, well, what about this, and well, what about that, and, and they had all kinds of, uh, when they discussed these things, there were all kinds of uh, conflicts that they would bring up, and so there was nothing really, so when this young child uh, came and they were amazed at his knowledge of the scriptures, but to have things out here that they couldn't answer, most of the time they couldn't answer even one another mm -hmm. a, a great deal. So, um, yeah, but I bet you there was a lot of assumptions though that they took for granted that he went to mm -hmm. and said that, explain this, explain yeah. that if it right. works that way, you know, and they probably couldn't come up with anything. Yep. So I don't think he said, there, I proved you wrong. No, no, I don't no. think he said that at all. No. I think it's just that it was obvious to them that with his way of thinking, mm -hmm. it didn't make sense. So do you, they, do you, do you think in, in his intercourse with them there, um, he was very uh, affirmative in his highlighting these discrepancies? Or do you think he was more assessing them in his own mind? Uh, uh, he could see these discrepancies and was kind of becoming aware of, of what was going on in the leadership. I, I, I suspect he probably asked questions. Mm -hmm. And he asked questions to which the answer was obvious, but they didn't like it. A bit of both. But uh, uh, and I wonder <coughs> when his parents finally took him away, I think you can feel pretty pretty uh, accurately, there was a lot of discussion in high places. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they either marked it down or forgot, but I'm sure some were there when he finally came up in front of them before yep. he was killed. Uh, there had to be some memory of that somewhere. In Desire of Ages, now over to page 80, they would not admit that they had misapprehended the scriptures they claimed to teach. From one to another passed the inquiry, how hath this youth knowledge having never learned? The light was shining in darkness, but the darkness apprehended it not. John 1, 5. So that was the story of the time when Jesus was 12. What happened next? You know, this is what we have to be careful of today, that we are so set in our way and our interpretation that we can't... What do you mean? We have the truth, right? But we have to look at what the words really say. Yeah. Well, all churches everywhere, they have their own little pet, um, this is the way it is, this is the way it is, this is the way it is. Yeah, yeah. Well, that just shows you that 
all those other churches, how they get set in their ways. And if they would just listen to what I tell them or we tell them, <laughs> <laughs> then we could get some of these problems <laughs> solved. They need to read. Set it my way. <laughs> okay, well, what, seriously now, what comes next in the story, in the narrative, if we go chronologically? Not too much until he turns up to get baptized. Yeah. He, John so that years, yes. the next thing that happens is really John the Baptist. What do we know about John the Baptist? He was a cousin. He was a cousin. Is there is there a chance he could have had connections and interaction with John the Baptist prior to this time when John the Baptist really shows up? Again, the Bible implies that that was not true. Ellen White just specifically says so. Mm -hmm. They had never seen each other except that time when Mary and Elizabeth got together. Yeah, and well, they weren't seeing each other then. There was a few uh, layers of mother in between. John was baptizing generally, which up to mm -hmm. that point I don't think was too common. Well, here, yeah, well, they, the Jews went, Jesus later said, you know, you go, you travel over mountain and oceans in order to baptize, you know, one or two people and you make them twice the son of the devil as before you got a hold of them. Whoa. So they were, they were doing some baptizing. Like not much, not much. John showed up, and he's out there in the wilderness. You know, you would think nobody would pay any attention to him, but what was his appeal? Well, they were all looking for the Messiah. Exactly. They were looking for Messiah, and why would they think of someone like John? Just getting close to the time. Just Did he? Up. Okay, it's getting for some close sort to of the a time. Rebel. And Did, and uh, John was preaching. John was out there doing something. He was okay. saying a message. It was the message of the Messiah, and the people came to hear him and repent of their sins. Any other reasons why they might get excited about him? had not had prophets for a long time. 400 years without a prophet, okay. Did Anything John else? remind them of a particular prophet in their past? Like who? Elijah, maybe? Elijah. Elijah. What were the last words they had from a previous prophet? Do you remember? Malachi. Malachi chapter 4. Look at Malachi chapter 4, the last two verses in the Old Testament. But before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes, I will send the prophet Elijah. He will bring fathers and children together again. Otherwise, they would have to come and destroy your country. So they were looking for the coming of Elijah, and what kind of form did Jesus come in? He dressed like Elijah, he sounded like you mean Elijah. John the Baptist? Yeah, John the Baptist. Yeah. Dressed like Elijah, sounded like Elijah, was out there preaching in the wilderness like Elijah. I mean, here you go. And that rumor spread around, it was the most exciting thing that had happened in Israel in hundreds of years. Also, was. Um, how is the different the message of John the Baptist different from the Jewish leaders who baptized? Uh, well, there was a message difference. At the time, let me read from Matthew three. At that time, John the Baptist came to the desert of Judea and started preaching, "Turn away from your sins," he said, "because the kingdom of heaven is near." John was the man the prophet Isaiah was talking about when he said. Someone is shouting in the desert, prepare a road for the Lord, make a straight path for him to travel. John's clothes were made of camel's hair. He wore a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts. By the way, that's grasshoppers. That's not beans. That's grasshoppers. Oh. <laughs> grasshoppers and wild honey. Thanks, heaps. <laughs> people, well, people I like eat the beans better. <laughs> yeah. I've People. had grasshoppers. Yeah. It's good protein in them. You it read is. about yeah. it. Oh, gotta, still gotta eat them. Gotta try it once. I should, I should have brought my picture. I have pictures of, at certain seasons of the year, you Roast can, in, in, in East Africa, you, they will, at the bus stops, you can get them either fried up and ready to eat, or you can get them fresh. And you can eat them fresh, or you can eat them. They just pull off the wings so that they can't fly away, and there's all, you can buy a big bowl of them for, you know, almost nothing. Now, this message that John the Baptist was giving. I can see, I can see Jay's mouth watering. <laughs> I can hardly wait to get to Africa. This, this message that John the Baptist was giving, is this the same message that is supposed to be given before Christ returned yeah, in our day? How about that? Repent, make, uh, 
clean up your act, get so, uh, make your path ready for the Lord. Here's the question. And are we supposed to be eating a di- a simple diet to like John was? Yeah, grasshoppers. <laughs> Remember it's the it's the sauces that that put the weight on. Avoid the sauces with your grasshopper. <laughs> did, did, you mean when they're covered with chocolate? <laughs> did, did John think he was this new Elijah? He did. He said, well, I don't know if he... Yeah, I'm sure he did. He said, it's my job to prepare for the coming of the Messiah. And where did he get that idea? From his mother? From his mother. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, I thought somebody asked him or asked somebody. Yeah, well, I'm, he, I'm reading on. Wasn't. So, people came to him from Jerusalem, from the whole province of Judea, and from all over the country near the Jordan River. They confessed their sins, and he baptized them in the Jordan. When John saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming to him to be baptized, he said to them, You snakes! (laughs) Nice, friendly kind of a greeting. (laughs) Who told you you could escape from the punishment God is about to send? Do Do those things that will show that you've turned from your sins. And don't think you're going to escape punishment by saying that Abraham is our ancestor. Um, I tell you that God can take these rocks and make descendants for Abraham. The axe is ready to cut down the trees at the roots. Every tree that does not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water to show that you you have repented. But the one who will come after me will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. He is much greater than I am, and I'm not good enough even to carry his sandals. He has his winnowing shovel with him and thresh out, thresh with him to thresh out all the grain. He will gather his wheat into his barn, but he will burn the chaff in a fire that never goes out. So he was pretty blunt with them. And the news got around, I'll tell you, and people flocked out there. I mean, this was the most exciting thing that happened in Israel in many years. He wasn't telling people about God's grace, how God's going to forgive them, and that they don't need to change, that God will cover all the sins. He, he just point blank said, repent and get your yes, life in order. Yes. And, and along those lines, verse 8, he said, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Yeah. So we're saved by grace, but we still need to do something. Saved by a gracious God. Saved by a gracious God, yeah. but he still wants us to produce, produce some fruit. fruit. Well, the next thing that happens is Jesus shows up. And what happened when Jesus showed up? Was he alone? Yes. Um, He was all alone. No disciples yet. And what did he do? Matthew 3, starting 13 to... Well, at that time Jesus arrived from Galilee and came to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. But John tried to make him change his mind. I ought to be baptized by you, John said, and yet you have come to me. How did John know that this was the one? That's a good question. What happened? The only possible way is that God pointed it out to him. But Jesus answered him, Let it be so for now, for in this way we shall do all that God requires. So John agreed. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he came up out of the water. Then heaven was opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God come down like a dove and lighting on him. Then a voice said from heaven, This is my own dear son with whom I am pleased. So, what happens? Jesus comes up out of the water. He is the third member of the Godhead, or the second member, if depending on how you want to count them. And who comes out comes down to bless the occasion? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit in the form of the dove. And the voice comes down from whom? From God God the Father. Father. God the Father saying, this is my son whom I'm well pleased.
Welcome back. We're, we've gotten really carried away with our story here. We're having here, now Jesus has come up after his baptism. What happens next? Before you leave that, mm -hmm. when he came up out of the water, who all gathered there could hear the voice and see the dove? Only John the Baptist? No, no, there were other people there, but apparently not. Uh, um, and let's go over, there's, I believe it's Luke. Remember, these stories are told in other places. After all the people had been baptized, Jesus also was baptized. While he was praying, heaven was open, and the Holy Spirit came down upon him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice from heaven, You are my own dear son, I am pleased with you. Uh, let's see, Matthew 3, Mark 1. Let's try Mark 1. It talks about these in different places. Um, not long after Jesus came from Nazareth in the province of Galilee and was baptized by John and the Lord. And as soon as Jesus came up out of the water, he saw heaven opening and the Spirit coming down on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my own dear son, I am pleased with you. At once the Spirit made him go into the desert where he stayed 40 days being tempted by Satan. Wild animals were there also, but angels came and helped him. Uh, I guess it's Ellen White that says, that uh, the other people heard the noise, they saw something happening, but apparently it was only John and Jesus and maybe some of the other disciples who actually understood what was being said. You think when Jesus showed up there, he was going out to hear John the Baptist, or he knew no, he, this was there. This was uh, this was. He the was beginning now of thirty. Something. He was at the age where the Jews would accept him as a as as a rabbi, as a teacher. He now was was an adult male, so it was time to start his work. I don't think he did anything that just happened. No. I think every, every action, every place he went, every word, he and God had planned this very carefully the mm -hmm. night before in prayer or that morning in their conversations about the day's business. Do you, you think John the Baptist was surprised at all this or you think he was, well, he, he's, pre he's, he's preaching, get ready because this event is coming. So do you think he was looking each day? I think so. It, you know, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to happen one of these days. And uh, John, you see, John couldn't have been preaching more than six months because Jews were not allowed to preach officially until they were 30. And Jesus had started, you know, presumably started his ministry very soon after he was 30. So somewhere about, John had only been preaching probably six months. And you know he he knew that this he knew that Jesus was only six months younger than he was. Hmm. Well, but he's kind of a rebel anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, what happened next? Jesus was led out into the wilderness. Was he? He was led. He didn't go. There's a very interesting comments here. Look at look at uh, Mark one verse twelve. At once the Spirit made him go into the desert. Now compare that with Matthew, chapter three. Chapter four. Chapter four. Actually, four, four verse one. Then the spirit led, spirit led Jesus into the desert to be tempted by the devil. Mm, wow. What is going on there? And if you go over to Luke, you find a slightly different version of that story. Um, after all the people had been bad uh, to see, no, I guess, it, Jesus returned from the Jordan, chapter 4, full of the Holy Spirit and was led by the Spirit into the desert where he was, t where he was tempted by the devil for 40 days. Slightly different wording. So what does that imply? Was this something Jesus had to go through or was it something? Yes. Yes. Well, let's talk about that. Jesus went out into the wilderness to speak with his Father and with the Holy Spirit to plan his ministry. Mm -hmm. That's what he was out there for. He was out there to dedicate, to pray and to fast and to talk about what, what they were going to do. The devil didn't show up until he thought he was at his weakest moment, clear at the end of that time. Mm -hmm. So when it says he was led up by the Spirit to be tempted by the devil, it means he was led up by the Spirit, he was fasting and praying for days and days and days, and finally, he was tempted by the devil. It doesn't mean that God intentionally led Jesus into temptation. Okay. Jesus himself said, pray, what? 
lead us not into temptation. temptation. So there's no way God could be leading his own son into temptation. So, and what happened during those 40 days? We, I've s talked about that a little bit. What happened at the end of the 40 days? Well, when he was at his weakest, is probably next to death at 40 days without food, mm -hmm. uh, then he was tempted by the adversary. And what was the temptation? <clears throat> First of all, to feed himself. Yes. Make, turn the stones into bread if you're the who you think you are. Then the devil, <clears throat> well. Is, is there something, uh, and I, I guess I'm going to, I mean, there's a purpose for fasting. Mm -hmm. um, it's my understanding that it, I don't know, it can clarify yeah. your mind a great deal. I recently read a if book. It doesn't go on too long. Right. Recently read a book about um, Louis Zamperini. Uh, it's a famous book, Undaunted, not Undaunted, Unbroken, right now. It's about a fellow who was uh, World War II and, and was sh uh, shot down his bomber, and he was adrift on the ocean for 47 days. And one of the things that he describes there after about 40 days in this circumstance is in a, is a, and of course now these these fellows are, they're, they're desperate for, well, they're, they're getting some food, etc. But he does describe there a, a time when there's a s s absolute clarity of, of mind. So this fasting process does have, mm -hmm. there is something to that. There's a reason for it that helps you to clarify your mind so that you can be attuned to, in this case, mm -hmm. some spiritual thing. Your mind is uncluttered. Yeah. Is, is there, yeah. you, is, this, is it is your this understanding? Yes. Mm -hmm. I, don't I, think, know. I think it kind of ex <clears throat> it expresses your will that you're asking for something. When you deny yourself that food, um, I think what you said is true, but I think there is actually a um, some evidence that you really want what you're asking for when you're not. Is there, in the last half of, uh, this is in Mark, getting back to Mark, last half of verse 13 that says, and he was with the wild beasts and the angels were ministering to him. Yes. So he might have got some fortification there that we don't necessarily get. Yeah. Well, that's, that's the, the point I, I wonder about. If you keep, you know, this talk that angels actually physically came down and helped him, um, where does that happen with anybody else? If, mm -hmm. if Jesus didn't have any other... You ha wait till you hear your story and my story and our story when you get to heaven. Find out what your guardian is, how your guardian well, is. Yeah, that's, care of you. that's true, but I'm talking about the physical, okay. the physical manifestations that people say happened to Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, it could have happened, I don't know, but um, uh, there would be a problem there as far as I'm concerned if that happened. Mm -hmm. As far as him having some favoritism to actually have the angels well, come down. I read the passage that said every child can be educated the same way Jesus was. Okay, so that tells you that there wasn't any physical. Not necessarily. It, uh, it I mean, has that ever happened to you? No. Has it happened to anybody that you know? No. So how are you going to conclude that? I'm going to conclude that's because that's inspired message. No, but um, I'm not interpreting it that way. Perhaps. You're interpreting it different than I am. Yeah. And I, I still think it's an inspired message too, but I don't necessarily um, believe or interpret that there's a physical manifestation of angels happening. But well, I think if, we, if you're honest, if we're more focused like Christ was, we'd probably get a whole lot more blessings than we do. Yeah. If there had been direct contact with angels or whatever, it wouldn't be a unique situation because there's records where, where God appeared to exactly. Moses Elijah, and to Joshua Elijah. and to Samuel. Is so, Daniel? It's, it, Daniel. There's, so it wouldn't be a unique situation with Jesus. Well, that's true. There's modern, it seems like modern he modern would be the, well. the least likely to have it to, to go through the whole test that the worst no. person could go through. If so God, if I'm, God, I'm, that's all I'm thinking about. God is a parent. He has, a parent has a duty to teach his kids. And how he accomplishes this, whether he communicates directly with Mary or somehow he got the message across because we have, a, we have the evidence. Well, so what, what happens here, Ken, after these 
40 days or, or what Well, there were the what three is temptations. All, what is, what's the purpose of all Pres this? Presume that those are... And the and, and devil says, look, if there's some stones, they look a lot like bread. You know, you know, I've heard a rumor that someone was cast out of heaven. Maybe you're that person that was cast out of heaven. So tell me, if, if you think you're the Son of God, can you turn those stones into bread? Especially since you're so hungry here. Mm -hmm. What better time? That's right. Weakest yeah. point. Yep. And what was Jesus' response? What was wrong with that? I mean, have you ever been tempted to turn rocks into bread? I've been hungry. I've been tempted to do a lot of things. Maybe wish you could. Wish you could but <laughs> Maybe wish that. you could. But if I'd have had one, the power, boy, I'd have turned those into... You know, one time I saw potatoes on the ground. I was tempted to cook those and eat them. <laughs> it's kind of like rocks. They look like rocks. <laughs> I don't think that's what we're talking about. Here. Well, well, that's my point there. Um, um, I don't have the power to do yeah. that, so it's not going to tempt me. But exactly. if I had power to cook potatoes, well, then I might do that. Yeah. But he so, wasn't doing anything for his own self-interest. Yeah. He was not self-centered. And the self big question here, the big <clears throat> issue here is he said, if you are the Son of God, you don't have to prove something unless it's in doubt. Prove it. Prove it to yourself here. You know, go ahead and prove yourself you're this guy. <laughs> the thing about this is, this, all three of these temptations and Satan's statements, Satan knew perfectly well that that was the Son of God, and Jesus knew perfectly well that Satan knew who he was. Satan was simply trying to get Jesus to use his power just like many times in his life people said you know just give us a demonstration of your power. Mm -hmm. Work a miracle or two and then we'll believe. Mm -hmm. They were no more going to believe than anything mm -hmm. and neither was Satan. Nothing would have changed if Jesus would have done any one of those things. Mm -hmm. Well, but p part of this, I, f I feel that part of this temptation was to prove it to Jesus himself. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, that's true, because mm -hmm. did he do any miracles <clears throat> before that time? No, not that we well, know about. Um, isn't there kind of, don't you think he could, could kind of wonder if maybe, well, can I really do this? This will verify what I'm going to, who I am, you know, and he knows it would be the right, wrong time to do that. Okay, so and let's move on, because we, we don't have an unlimited amount of time here. Where did he go next? The devil took him up on top of the temple. Him. Why would he take him there? Did Jesus say, oh, help, 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 get me off of here? What, what did he say? Showed him the kingdoms of the world. No, no. Bef Just that was yourself the down, then the angels oh, yeah. will bury you up. And where did he get that idea? Oh, there's a place in the Bible that says that. Okay. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> exactly. But did he quote it accurately? Mm, probably. He, he misquoted it accurately. He misquoted it. He <laughs> left out the passage as, to keep thee in all thy ways. That didn't fit his story, so he, he left that part out. And Jesus said what? What was Jesus' response? Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Okay, well, yeah. And then what happened next? Now, Matthew and Luke have these temptations in a slightly different order. I don't think that really matters. What happened next? Nice that Jesus reminded Satan about who was the Lord here. Mm -hmm. Don't be putting your Lord to the test. And in a way... Uh, Jesus kind of would have been obeying Satan had he done anything Satan was telling him to do. As, as anyways, Jesus could have done those things on any other day, but here it was take Satan us. asking him. Take instruction from Satan. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so he said, uh, "Worship the Lord your God and serve Him only. Away from me, Satan." Yeah. And then the devil took Jesus to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and all their greatness. All this I will give you, the devil said, if you kneel down and worship me. Mm. And then Jesus answered, Go away, Satan. The scripture says, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left Jesus and angels came and helped him. Okay, so now what happens next? When Satan comes to you, he always leaves a word out or changes a word. So you have to be very careful, mm -hmm. very careful. 
But if 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 I tell him to go away like Jesus did, is there power in those words? Mm -hmm. And he he has to comply with that. Can't hang around. I don't know exactly how that is, but it seems to be true. Yes. The yeah. next thing was there a wedding? Well, not yeah. quite. Yeah, notice something disciples. very interesting. There's an important thing we need to notice in John chapter one. Look at John chapter one, starting with verse twenty-nine. Something we need to notice here, very significant. How do we work out the chronology of the life of Christ? Well, look at this. Verse 29, the next day John saw Jesus coming to him and said, there is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I was talking about when I said, a man is coming after me, but he's greater than I am because he existed before I was born. I did not know who he would be. See, that's the idea of they're not knowing each other. But I came baptizing at the water in order to make him known to the people of Israel. And John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down like a dove from heaven and stay on him. I still do not know that, did not know that he was the one. But God, who sent, who sent me to baptize with water, had said to me, You will see the Spirit come down and stay on a man. He is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. I have seen it, said John, and I tell you that he is the Son of God. Then, verse 35, the next day, John was standing there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus walking by, there is the Lamb of God, he said. The two disciples heard him say this and went with Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following him and asked, what are you looking for? They answered, where do you live, Rabbi? This word means teacher. Come and see, he answered. It was then about four o'clock in the afternoon. So they went with him and saw where he lived, and he spent the rest of that day with them. They spent the rest of that day with him. One of the, them was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. At once he found his brother Simon and told him, We have found the Messiah. I mean, can you imagine what those... I mean, we, we read that and we say, Okay, can you imagine what those words meant to a Jew? This word means Christ. Then he took Simon to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, Your name is Simon, son of John, but you will be called Cephas, that is the same as Peter. Peter is, Cephas is the Aramaic, Peter is Greek, it means a rock. The next day, what are you beginning to see here? Putting his disciples together. Yeah, and he's given the very precise chronological sequence, isn't it? Not taking him very long. No. And what we're going to say, and I'm, I'm going to say a few words about this, but if you look carefully through the Gospel of John, you'll discover that he, he spells out, he says, and a certain Passover happened, and then the Passover happened, and the Passover happened. John is the only one of the writers of the Gospels who sort of spreads the, the ministry of Jesus out over three and a half years. If you read only Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you would think the entire ministry of Jesus happened in one year. Mm -hmm. There's no hint that it lasted three and a half years. So we have to go to the Gospel of John, to, and, and here we see that John, at least on some occasions, was very precise in saying the next day, the next day this is what happened, the next day this is what happened. So John is the one who gives us the chronology that we tend to follow in, in trying to analyze the, the historicity. And, of the and possibly in part because he was aware that mm -hmm. um, this information needed to be disseminated. Yeah. So John was taken prisoner somewhere in here, wasn't he? Where does that fall? Well, hold on. Not, not, not no, quite yet. yet. We're coming. Um, yeah. Um, Jesus was Jesus' ministry is divided into three major parts, all connected to events in the life of John the Baptist. After his baptism by John, he began his public ministry. For approximately one and a half years, he traveled mostly quietly, but fairly widely, predominantly in Judea, and often by himself, teaching and preaching, and healing. When John was arrested and put into prison, Jesus called the twelve disciples and shifted his ministry mostly to Galilee and focused on teaching the multitudes. And he stayed away from Jerusalem for a full year, at least a year, maybe a year and a half. Is that because John wasn't around to, to do that kind of preaching anymore? It's because they had already told him prior to that, you know, they already put out wanted dead or alive notices sort of yeah. for Jesus. So he decided not to go. He had a ministry to do in Galilee. So he said that's where he went. Okay. After John's death. So 
we have these periods. First of all, John is still baptizing. Jesus is quietly traveling around through Judea, trying to stay under the radar, you know. Is this without his disciples? Basically without his disciples. Maybe with one or two, but basically without the twelve. So the first year of his ministry, active ministry, he's, he's pretty well a one-man show. In Judea, we know almost nothing about what happened during that time. He was, he was going out by himself. Then when John is arrested and put in prison, Jesus says, okay, it's time to clear out of Judea. And he goes to Galilee. And at that point, shortly after arrival in Galilee, he names his 12 disciples. And he says, okay, now the time has come for me not just to work by myself, but to work with these disciples. And for the next uh, year, he is focusing on Galilee. And that's the year that we talk about in Matthew, Mark, and part of Luke. Then Jesus takes six months with his disciples, mostly just by themselves, travels to Tyre and Sidon and up to Caesarea Philippi and back and forth. He travels back to Galilee just briefly and then he leaves again. Basically, he's working with his disciples for six more months. Then finally Jesus says, okay, he now knows that it's time, the final Passover day is coming. And so he takes his disciples, he now starts moving very widely in public, but he realizes that in Galilee and Judea it's not really safe for him to do that, so he's on the other side of the Jordan River. There's some Jewish people over there, but the, like, like John the Baptist, when he's over there, the Jews are flocking to him on the other side of the Jordan. And he basically repeats pretty much everything he taught in Galilee, he now repeats for the people on the other side of the Jordan. And that story, what happened over there on the other side of the Jordan, is, to, is told starting with Luke 9, uh, I think it's verse 55 or something like that. That starts 57. No, I'm sorry, 51. Uh, As the time drew near when Jesus would ta be taken up to heaven, he made up his mind and set out on his way to Jerusalem, etc. And so that's the time he's working. So in that final six months, he's drawing as much attention to himself as he possibly can, but he's staying a little ways beyond the reach of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He's over in Gentile territory. It looks like he's just kind of being a moving target yeah. at the beginning. And then at the, going, coming to the end, he kind of, who knows what was keeping, keeping um, him yeah. safe, you know. Well, and then as the Passover time arrives, or just about ready, Great crowds gather together and they start to move down toward Jerusalem to prepare. And Jesus and his disciples join one of those huge gatherings. And we'll talk about the events that happen as he moves down, finally reaches, of course, Jerusalem and uh, is crucified just before Passover happens. So that's the general pattern for what happened in the life of Christ. So now coming back to where we are, he's now, he's not calling his disciples, they're coming to him. One gathers, you, did you know? Come, you, come. You know, they're, they're, they're calling each other and saying, we found the Messiah and so forth. So the next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, come with me. Now there's one person he said to come. Philip was with, from Bethsaida. So he was way up in the north of Galilee. He wasn't supposed to be down here in Jericho area. So maybe that's why Jesus said, come with me. Uh, Philip was from Bethsaida, the town where Andrew and Peter lived. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one who's, whom Moses wrote about in the book of the law and whom the prophets also wrote about. He is Jesus, son of Joseph, from Nazareth. And what did Nathanael say? Anything from good. Nazareth? Mm -hmm. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Well, what did, what did, what did Philip say? Come and see. Come and see. That's the right answer. Come and see for yourself. Check it out. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him, he said to him, Here is a real Israelite. There is nothing else, nothing false in him. By the way, who was Nathanael? Do you, if you read the list of disciples over in chapter 10 of Matthew, which one is Nathanael? How many Nathanaels do we have? Is Nathanael the one that Jesus says, I saw you under the fig tree? Mm-hmm. Find him, in, uh, find him for me in Matthew 10, the first four verses, would you? I 
Don't see him in there. Well, what happened to him? Anybody have an idea what happened to Nathaniel? No, well, it's just more proof you can't believe everything this book says. <laughs> Did he get another name? A different name? He has another name. Andrew? His, no, his other name is Bar Ptolemy. Uh, Bartholomew. Bartholomew. Yeah, there you go. What's the name of Ptolemy? Where did that name come from? Remember? Well, Ptolemy was the name of the, the general, kings, the, 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 the leaders, the, the Greek leaders for, from Egypt, wasn't yeah, it? Egypt, yeah. So he, his, he was Nathaniel, son of Ptolemy. Okay? So it's Bartholomew, same person. Okay. Don't get excited about not <laughs> believing the Bible. <laughs> okay. So Nathaniel <laughs> asked him. Excuses. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> when Jesus saw Nathaniel coming to him, he said, Here is a real Israelite. There is nothing false in him. And Nathaniel asked him, How do you know me? <clears throat> Jesus answered, I saw you when you were under the fig tree before Philip called you. Teacher, answered Nathaniel, You are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Now, and what did that mean? Um, that was always confusing. Oh. Well, Nathaniel is blown away by the fact that Jesus obviously saw him. He said, man, of course he wasn't. Yeah, but then it sounded like he kind of rebuked him a little bit for believing so easily. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Jesus said, do you believe just because I told you I saw you when you were under the fig tree? You will see much greater things than this. And he said to them, I am telling you the truth. You will see heaven open and God's angels going up and down on the Son of Man. So he's, he's got a lot to go. Well, we've come near the end of our time. We have seen, we've looked at the events of the early life of Christ up through the first uh, few months, month or so of his ministry. Uh, we're going to pick up next time, next week, we'll talk about how it proceeds from there. He goes on to, into Judean ministry. We know almost nothing about that Judean ministry. And then he prepares, he has some episodes with the people, with the leaders in Jerusalem, and we'll talk about that. That will be the main emphasis when we come next time. Make sure you're there. See you then.